This is best podcast ever. Oh my god, we didn't hit record. This is what happens when you've got two two people tired and excited. <laughs> Let's just tired jump and in excited. and go. This is the English way of saying it. Tired and excited. Jouissance. 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 <laughs> Jouissance. <laughs> Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the Pleasure of the Text podcast, a shared imaginative space where readers and writers make meaning together. We're your hosts, Shannon and Gareth. Hello, Shannon. I'm very excited about this. I don't have a word for it uh, because of the limitations of English, but I'm extremely excited about this podcast. I know you're excited and because uh, the namesake of our podcast actually comes from the man we're going to be talking about today, The Pleasure of the Text. So the author of The Pleasure of the Text is Roland Barthes. Roland Barthes. I love how you put that S in there correctly. Um, So this is something we're, we're going to talk about The Pleasure of the Text briefly today on our way to talking about what the podcast is actually about this week, which is A Lover's Discourse. But it would seem odd not to mention the pleasure of the text, given it's the name of our, our podcast proper. So, so we're fixing up a few names things. This is our admin for the, uh, for the morning. And the first one is, yes, Roland Barthes, not Roland Bart. Now, um, I've been corrected on this numerous times, but I have the, the evidence is in, folks. So this is, a, uh, this is an interview with uh, L'Express from May 1970. And uh, at the time, Barts was talking about his book, Essed, which was an analysis of uh, an uh, Honoré de Balzac short story, Sarazin. Um, and so they're talking about S's and Z's, as you do in a French interview. And the interviewer mentions the S at the end of Bart's name. And Bart responds, yes, I'm used to having that S at the end of my name disappear into thin air. Now, you know very well that fiddling with a proper noun is a serious thing. It's interfering with property, which doesn't bother me, but also with integrity, to which no one is indifferent, I suppose, especially when he has just read a story of castration. So, yes, Bart's with an S, and when you don't use the S, you are castrating his ghost. Think about that next time you leave the S off. Yes. What do you reckon, Shannon? Um, castration and ghosts. This is actually the month of romance. So we're going to jump into <laughs> a lover's discourse, <laughs> which, discourse. um, this is one of the books that you mentioned in our, the books that shaped you podcast. And did you want to talk mm. a bit about why this book had such a huge impact upon you before we get into all the exciting, uh, research we've done on this podcast? Okay. Yeah. Um, well, very briefly, uh, I was given this book by my sister, uh, when I was a very young man, I had been, uh, rejected by a lady. Uh, we'd been going out for a short time and, and she said goodbye to you. And I was trying to find a, like an English way to sound French about this. And, you know, the affair was over, the passion was dead and I was crushed. And my sister gave me this book and said, read this, you'll feel better. And I read it and I felt better. And the reasons why are very interesting. But this book, when we talk about uh, readable and writable texts, this was an extremely writable text for me, A Lover's Discourse, um, which is to say that it wrote me too. It it rewrote my um, emotional DNA. And and it was quite a profound experience for me. It's definitely one of the top five books of all time. Mm. Fiction and nonfiction. I think this is an incredible piece of work. And then, of course, uh, I went on and studied it um, all the way up the charts at uni. Uh, I did my honours thesis on it and from there uh, springboarded into Bart's other works, specifically S. Z., which is the analysis of a story about a castrato. But we're not talking about that because this is uh, an episode on love. Yeah. And so I have to be completely honest, until I'd met you, I'd never heard of Roland Barthes before or The Pleasure of the Text. Um, And I 
think that I'm not alone in that experience. And I actually have a quote that I'm going to give to you and I want you Mm. to respond to it. One consequence of Bart's breadth of focus is that his legacy includes no following of thinkers dedicated to modeling themselves after him. The fact that Bart's work was ever adapting and refuting notions of stability and constancy means there is no kind of thought within his theory to model one's thoughts upon, and thus no Bartism. Well, yes. I mean, <clears throat> that's... um. That's true to the extent that there isn't a, a great field of Bartists floating around. Um, I consider myself a Bartist, but I'm not a person of note, and so they probably didn't recognize me over here in obscurity. Um, but I think they're wrong also about Bart's body of work. I think it's incredibly consistent. And one thing we'll talk about at length over the coming months, years, and decades is the idea of coming back indifference. Not indifference, but indifference. Ideas recurring indifference, which is an extremely important uh, concept in writing fiction. Um, And it's really a Bartzian concept. And it's one that should be really built into the fabric of creative writing courses. So, So maybe, you know, maybe as a community we'll make that happen. That's what I'm hoping. Mm. And, I mean, we've called the podcast The Pleasure of the Text, and I think it's because he talks about the difference, the pleasure, the bliss of reading a readerly text and reading a writerly text. Did you want to give a very quick definition before I jump into reading actually some excerpts from The Pleasure of the Text for the audience? Um, Yeah, look, I mean, the basic, so we've talked about open and closed texts, um, and I was saying before that uh, A Lover's Discourse rewrote me as well. So I guess the way of looking at it is that a readable text, uh, and there are lots of brilliant readable texts, no one's, no one's dissing the readable texts. Um, they are products that can be read that will, uh, they're, they're generally reasonably easy to read, very pleasant to read. They have pleasure attached to them. I love reading um, Ian Fleming novels, James Bond novels. I don't find them challenging. I find them incredibly enjoyable and exciting and, you know, and sexy and dangerous and all that great stuff. But it's a very readable text. I don't find that I am incredibly marked by them. And I find I don't particularly interpret them. Uh, so it is a particular thing. It's very pleasurable, readable texts. The pleasure of the text refers to readable texts. That's pleasure. Um, what Shannon and I are very excited about and what we try to achieve in our writing are writable texts. Um, some people call this literature, but of course a lot of literature is readable. Um, but a writable text is one that when you read it, it's it remains open. So you read a readable text, you close the book, the book is closed, it's on your shelf, you forget about it to a large extent. A writable text, it's hard to get that sucker shut. You finished it, but it remains open and it's just, it's, it's constantly being reread in your mind. Bits recur. You misremember and you misread bits a la Harold Bloom and you start coming up with your own ideas based on this. So, so essentially, reading becomes an act of writing. Um, now, the other thing that occurs is that in particularly writable texts, the really open ones, they tend to also start rewriting their readers. Uh, there was that quote about first rank fiction. I never saw it that way. I'll never see it any other way again. Like that, yeah. this has completely changed me. So these books write you you write them and you make this incredible meaning together. It feels cooperative. And the idea that Bart had around that was not just pleasure, but something that we stumblingly describe in English as bliss. So Shannon and I are trying to achieve bliss as writers, a blissful experience for anyone who may come into contact with our writing. Um, And, that is a slightly different 
objective to someone who wants to create a readable text where people are desperate for the next installment and then they forget about it, but they really want the next installment. This is a different thing, essentially. Mm. They're not really in competition with each other, I don't think. Yeah. You actually mentioned a word in when you were talking about readerly text. It's a product. Mm. Um, you, It's consumed, whereas a writerly text, it sounds like you are consumed to buy it. Uh, so your brain, your mind is devoted at least some part of it towards being changed to what you have just read. Yeah, and you also produce a writerly text. You're not mm. just reading it. You're kind of writing it. And um, and so, yeah, you have consumption and production as a sort of warring. In a readable text, you do do some production. It's it's not like people read them mindlessly and they're drooling and they've gone into zombie states and they're terrible things because they're not. It's just that the the imaginative work is largely done by the writer in, in certain ways. And perhaps some of the more difficult structural work is never attempted because the patterns are familiar and they're familiar to the reader too. So as a, as an experience, it's very immersive and easy. And then you come out and immerse yourself in something else. Um, these productive, writerly open texts, they dig a lot deeper into you. And not everyone's into that, um, but they, they do. They dig a lot deeper into you and can profoundly change the shape of your life. Um, and you and I can read the same book and have profoundly different readings of it, whereas with readable texts, generally people read them the same way. The, in, the, the interpretations, the knowledge obtained is roughly similar. Mm. And so I've just finished our romance, well, my romance novel that I'm going to bring to the table in our review, uh, Book Lovers by Emily Henry. So to me, that was a closed text. It was enjoyable to read. I read it quite quickly. I think within five days, I closed the book, but I haven't thought about it again. And you said that uh, genres seem to follow this particular pattern they're produced in a particular way but that's not to say that these books within this genre can't be writerly texts as well a classic example is Ursula Le Guin for you which mm. resides in the world, world of fantasy yeah exactly and what you have with Le Guin is uh, there are certain I suppose readable aspects to her work uh, some stylistic stuff and some beats and tropes that she maintains and that define her work in the genre tradition. But then she does this other stuff. She plays with the tropes. She shifts them around. She disturbs them. And that is very writable because as a reader, you go, wait a minute, this isn't following the script. I'm confused. What's happening now? Why is, she, why is this happening? And you start asking those questions. Why? Why is this happening? As opposed to just experiencing it and going, oh, you know, Boromir is dead. That's that's a shocker. Uh, <laughs> you're like, wait a minute, Boromir can't die. That doesn't, wait, how would that be possible? And and it's a kind of a, it's more collaborative in a, in a sense or more democratic in, in a sort of a, a meaning-making capacity. Uh, yeah. So writers will work within the two. Some writers really write, very open texts with just a sheen of readability uh, and others. Yeah. It, it, we could even describe it as a spectrum. I don't think these things are diametrically opposed and at war. Yeah. Well, that's a, that's a good way of putting it. Um, so I'm going to jump into the pleasure of the text with some excerpts from that. And the first, the ones you're reading are actually not Bart's though, are they? They're his, his longtime translator and interpreter, Richard Howard? Yes. So why do you think Richard Howard wrote a note on the text in The Pleasure of the Text, which is what we're discussing right now? Um, I think because, well, Barthes, Roland Barthes is French and uh, we speak English, we read in English, and there's nuances in language that sometimes just can't get um, – translated and I think that's what Howard here is trying to do we're we're constrained by the words that he's going to use in his translations but he wants to say hang on there's actually a bit more going on here yeah I, I agree I think that's exactly it so it was it's 
It's very confusing. So Richard Miller did the translation but did not provide um, a, a preface of any description. Richard Howard provides the note on the text but didn't do the translation, but he has translated others of Bart's works. Uh, oh. Which is, yeah, it gets really confusing. I mean, one of them needs to change their names, I'm just saying, so that I don't get so confused. But, yeah, so Richard Howard is writing about a translation by Richard Miller, who he mentions in passing in a very flattering <laughs> way. But, um, but yes, yeah, so that's that's what we have here. Yeah. Okay, so a note on the text written by Richard Howard. Yes. Yes. Just had to make sure. <laughs> mm-hmm. Um the French have a distinguishing advantage which Roland Barthes, a Frenchman drawn through, has taken, has used, has exploited in his new book about what we do when we enjoy a text. The French have a vocabulary of eroticism, an amorous discourse which smells neither of the laboratory nor of the sewer, which just attentively, scrupulously puts the facts. In English, we have either the coarse or the clinical. And by tradition, our words for our pleasures, even for the intimate parts of our bodies, where we may take those pleasures, come awkwardly when they come at all. Oh, my. So just sorry to interrupt. Just to be clear, we're we're basically talking about orgasms, essentially, right? And stuff around that. Yes. And I kind of understand what he's saying here because we're going to be writing a sex slash romance scene a bit later on and you're stuck Mm. between how do you call these body parts? It's, yeah. It is tricky, isn't it? Because we don't have anything else for it. Thank God we have a thesaurus, but I tell you what, I was looking through the thesaurus just to see, you know, just get ahead. (laughs) <laughs> and, Good luck with um, that one. It's true. It's it's the laboratory or the sewer. It's clinical, of course. There's nothing that feels easy and in the same um, space as lovemaking and, and that sort of stuff. Like Unless, you know, I guess you could be a horny scientist or sewer worker and then maybe some stuff's going, are there romance books on that? No, probably not. Mm. That would the language there would be great, but I don't know what people are doing otherwise. I mean, if we could just write in French. If only. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Sorry. Back to you. All good. Back to Richard Howard. <clears throat> the Bible calls it knowing, while the Stuarts called it dying. The Victorians called it spending, and we call it coming. A hard look at the horizon of our literary culture suggests that it will not not be long before we come to a new word for orgasm proper. We shall call it being. It's not a bad guess. Hmm. Roland Barthes, in any case, calls it jouissance, as his own literary culture entitles him to do, and he associates his theory of the text in this new book with what has been a little neglected in his own and other French studies of what we may take, what we may have when we read. The pleasure of the text. Pleasure is a state, of course, bliche, jouissance, an action, and both of them in our culture are held to be unspeakable beyond words. Here, for example, is Willa Cather, a writer Bartz has never heard of, putting in a plea of nolo cotendere, which is, for all its insufferable air of customary infallibility, no more than symptomatic. All right, so just imagine I'm Willa Cather. <clears throat> the qualities of a first-rate writer cannot be defined, but only experienced. It is just the thing in him which escapes analysis that makes him first rate. One can catalogue all the qualities that he shares with other writers, but the thing that is his very own, his tombre, this cannot be defined or explained any more than the quality of a beautiful speaking voice can be. I don't know why you're not reading Richard Howard in a different <laughs> English accent. This would have been a lot fun, <laughs> a lot more fun. All right. Oh, I did my pirate voice. <laughs> in the puritism of our expressivity, what can be said is taken is likely to be no longer experienced, certainly no longer enjoyed. Yet Bartz has found for all Cather's strictures a way to speak pleasure, to affirm the pleasure we must take in our reading as against the indifference of mere knowledge, determined to instance 
our ecstasy, our bliss in the text against the prudery of ideological analysis, so that perhaps for the first time in the history of criticism, we have not only a poetics of reading, that I think is what Barthes has managed so marvellously to constitute in, in Essay, but a much more difficult, because supposedly inexpressible, apparently ineffable achievements, an erotics of reading. Richard Howard. Erotics of reading. Isn't that interesting? Mm. I mean, it's difficult to comment on it because, you know, stuck in English, uh, I feel like I should break into French. It's the only chance. Uh, Voulez-vous coucher avec moi ce soir? That's, it. That's pretty much all I've got. Um, yes. So, so I guess Kather is, is suggesting the magic of writing this first rate, indistinguishable, undefinable quality that makes geniuses geniuses and magic magic, which I just always find incredibly tiresome. Uh, goodness knows. Oh, this is how we get copy that says this is the best <sighs> writer of the decade, even though we're in 2023, right? Right. Yeah. The greatest writer of the millennium. <laughs> 2001's blah, 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 blah. Yeah. The it's, new it's, great American novel. Oh, my God. <laughs> yeah, it's, okay. it's just terrible. I may have to go out. Um, <laughs> we'll stop being facetious now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No, it's awful. It's awful. And I think what, um, what Bart's landed on, perhaps, as he worked his way towards the novelistic, there was always this thing with Barthes that he was going to write a novel, maybe. People always asked him, you're going to write a novel? And he's like, I'm sort of, I'm, you know, it could happen. Like I seem to be dancing around that kind of concept. I think that's a normal um, a thing a lot of people say in this contemporary day and age. Yeah. Yeah. Well, there was a great, I think maybe people thought, you know, what if he fails? Wouldn't that be fun? But also what if it was oh. amazing? Wouldn't that be fun? Uh, I think there was a little bit of that. Um, and I think he probably would have at some point. He was a very much, um, I think you'd call him a Victorian personality in some ways. He very much liked to like play piano in the afternoon. He bemoaned the fact that people didn't paint anymore just for the pleasure of painting. Um, I, I agree with him 100%. Uh, send me back 150 years, I'm ready to go. I think, <laughs> I think, I think all of that's just exactly right. Beam so him up, Scotty. Yeah, right. I'm in my red shirt. I'm ready to to be killed by some dude in a rubber suit. Um, yeah. So, so what he's doing is he's he's kind of he's speaking pleasure. He's not speaking about pleasure. Uh, now, if this sounds like a load of nonsense, hold on folks, because it will start to make more sense. But we've been talking about this idea that um, you can lose yourself in a book, you can write the book that you're reading, the book can read you. Um, you would not be speaking about its pleasures, would you, in that situation? You would be speaking its pleasures, and its pleasures would be speaking you. So this is kind of what it is. Uh, there's another quote from The Pleasure of the Text, actually from Barthes, um, that is worth uh, worth reading, and it kind of uh, more or less covers this, but in a much more intelligent, discerning, and literate way. Uh, so, quote: "Is pleasure only a minor bliss? Is bliss nothing but extreme pleasure? Is pleasure only a weakened conformist bliss, a bliss deflected through a pattern?" Of conciliations? Is bliss merely a brutal, immediate, without mediation pleasure? Good question, right? <laughs> okay. The writer of pleasure and his reader accepts the letter, renouncing bliss. He has the right and the power to express it. The letter is his pleasure. He is obsessed by it, as are all those who love language and not speech. So, logophiles, authors, letter writers, linguists, about texts of pleasure, therefore, it is possible to speak. Criticism always deals with texts of pleasure, never the texts of bliss. 
I think that's actually true to this day. Um, so you have Flaubert, Proust, Stendhal are discussed inexhaustibly. Thus, criticism speaks the futile bliss of the tutor text. It's past or future bliss you are about to read. I have read. Criticism is always historical or prospective. The constatory present, the presentation of bliss, is forbidden. Its preferred material is thus culture, which is everything in us except our present. With the writer of bliss and his reader begins the untenable text, the impossible text. This text is outside pleasure, outside criticism, unless it is reached through another text of bliss. You cannot speak on such a text. You can only speak in it, in its fashion, enter into a desperate plagiarism. Hysterically affirm the void of bliss and no longer obsessively repeat the letter of pleasure. Now, I don't know, like if, if you don't want to run off and read that book now, folks, I don't know what to tell you. It's complicated. But don't you feel like yeah. you're just kind of grasping at stuff, like you're almost hanging on to these ideas? And that's what I feel like when I am reading a writerly text. You you feel something's there and you're just touching it, you're flirting with it, and then you go back to everyday life, you put the book down, it's kind of disappeared. It can slip away from you. But I think um, this idea that criticism is always past or future – Barthes in another text says the, uh, the reading of the text is always its present. When you read, you are in a perpetual present. Um, the concept of when the book was written becomes irrelevant. You're in the present of the reading. The reading is primary and bliss comes in the present. It, it is, it is not, one does not have blissful experiences of the past or future. Bliss is present. And so criticism doesn't deal with that. It doesn't deal with that at all. And it does actually, to a large extent, um, ignore texts of bliss. It ignores difficult writers, loves classics, um, and, and deals with, when it does deal with difficult writers, it almost always deals with their easier works. Uh, because I think it is not so much that it's, it's avoiding something difficult, but criticism does exist in the past and the future. It's just not a present-based concept. Yeah. Writing theory and the practice of writing, the practice of workshopping, however, must exist in the present. That's why Barthes, in my opinion, is one of the great creative writing theorists, although he would not have said that of himself and no one else is saying it of him. Uh, as Bartists. Shannon, you and I, we're Bartists now. And okay, Bartsian we've been labelled. We've been labelled. Bartsian followers, acolytes of the Bart. Um, I think that's what we're talking about, this, this, this sort of idea that Barts is actually a, an absolute foundational figure in what could be an emerging creative writing theory and ideology. Um, I think he'd find that a real giggle too. I think, I think that would please him. Uh, whether or not he'd agree, I think he'd find it definitely a giggle. Which brings us, I think, to a lover's discourse, colon fragments. Um, I believe you've got a piece by Stephen Heath. Uh, Bart's on love. Yes, I do. Now, Stephen Heath was another of Barth's translators, and he translated, I think, uh, image music text, which includes the very important essay, The Death of the Author, uh, from about 67. Which is another one of your favorite books, right? I like image music text. I don't know if it's one of my absolute favorites, but The Death of the Authors are like a super important essay. Um, uh, it's probably something we'll talk about at some point, but it's essentially getting away from that author reading, you know, um, what were they thinking when they wrote this book that isn't apparently in the book 
and the post-structuralists would say, well, who cares? Uh, and uh, the Bartists, too, would probably say, who cares? I imagine Stephen Heath might even say, who cares? But yes. Yeah. Bart's on Love. Mm. By Stephen Heath. Published in 1977, A Lover's Discourse was a immediate success, rapidly becoming something of a French bestseller. Magazines from Elle to Playboy jostled for interviews. A television program quarterly brought together Bart's and Francois Sagan to confer on love. A theatrical adaptation by Pierre Leinhardt played in Paris at the Theatre Marie Stuart. Holy moly. That's pretty amazing, isn't it? Yes. Can you imagine? I don't know. Can you just imagine some dusty professor? Now, Bart's was in his... <laughs> uh, Early 60s, I think. Yeah, he would have been in his early 60s. And he's written a nonfiction book of somewhat literary theory, semiotics, sociology. It's, it could be put in any of those categories on your bookshelf. And it's a bestseller. I mean, can you imagine that happening in Australia right now? Can you imagine someone writing a book? on linguistics and people just going, I've got to get that book. I've got to get that I've got to get reading that one. Yeah, no. I can't imagine just <laughs> one of those big heavy accounting tombs that I had to read. Oh, oh becoming a, a play. Oh my god. Yeah, becoming a play. This and is then, how you balance income and expenses. <laughs> and then they have a television special. The one hour Shannon uh, Shannon's talking about uh a biological cruel. systems, uh, you know, with some other person and everyone's like, can I get a ticket? Um, can I have a signature? Sign my bra. <laughs> yeah, exactly. My God. Isn't it? It's just delightful. I wonder if Bart's had people throwing, uh, no, women throwing their panties at him. He may have done. I don't know what it would have done for him. Uh, but actually, no, yeah, to be honest, I don't know what it would do for anyone. Um, but yes, uh, just <laughs> astounding. Like he was like a bit of a rock star. He was, he was kind of the, the Tom Jones of French letters for a bit there. I will continue. Yeah. Sorry. Fragments I just get in excited. other words. <laughs> <laughs> Fragments in other words, marks the great moment of the cultural resonance of Bart's writing, its prestige, Bart's was almost a novelist, whereas mythologies 20 years earlier had marked the moment of the force of his writing as cultural analysis and criticism. I saw you look up. Did you want to interrupt again? I, I never want to stop interrupting. I'm like the little voice that's rewriting the text. You know, yeah, I just want to keep jumping in. I can't help myself. I just love that Bart as almost a novelist. I just like it yeah, the whole career of, of being almost a novelist. Yeah, you know, people are like, "Oh, I'm an aspiring novelist." Yeah, but then that's what you do, and you get paid to be that. Uh, yeah, it's wonderful. It's just a big flirtation. Very French. <laughs> very French. Yeah. Um, between the two books runs a whole movement, that of semiology, of the study of science and the systematic conditions of their significance. Followed by increasing attention to the terms of the production of meanings and of the relations of the individual as subjects in that production, in which Bart's can be seen as a constant initiator of shifts and displacements, his own work returning more and more, the spiral of a return differently to questions posed from a certain liking for aspects of an of an innerness of language and experience from points of subjective response of intensity, pleasure, the eye, the novel of the mask and persona and resistances of the ego, or as in fragments, a discourse of love. Yeah, now this, this is just such an interesting idea. So Bart talks about this himself in his work. The, the idea of returning indifference, something that returns in its difference, this can occur in the moment. So 
you can have a thing in its difference by having a sort of a, a plurality of meaning. So instead of having meaning that goes this, then that, then that, then that. And that is, to some extent, arguably the nature of readable texts. They have a kind of a linear logic that draws one, you know, giddily on the roller coaster of the story. The writerly texts have this and that, and that, and that. So we have signifiers that explode into various meanings. So things return in their difference. Um, but also, as creators of fiction, anyone listening to this podcast who wants to be a writer, you really do need to ask yourself, if you're a good reader, and, uh, you're a practiced reader, how many genuinely original ideas have you seen in literature in the last, let's say, thousand years? You will find that, and we found this in our romance uh, episode last week, the foundations of certain ideas can be traced back before Christ. Yeah. Um, you, it's very difficult to be truly, truly original. Um, and what great writers do, I would argue, is that they take ideas and return them to us in their difference. This is originality. The renovation of ideas and the way that you can turn an idea in such a way that you can never see that idea in any other way ever again until some other genius comes along and twists it even more and you're like, whoa, no, it's that. And that's the power of, of great writing. It's the way it can show you things you know in a way you've never known them. Mm, I agree. So this again is why Barthes is like the key writer of creative writing theory. Uh, because he deals with all these ideas that are not really dealt with by anyone else. Not really. There, um, there are a lot of assumptions made and references to earlier writers who have made assumptions with references to earlier writers. You trace it back and it ends up nowhere. There is no pot of gold at the end of the rainbow. It just goes nowhere. Where do you think the theory of literary writing is going? Because I remember you saying there hasn't been much innovation since Barthes. Yeah, there really hasn't. Um, as far as I can tell, it's not going anywhere. Uh, it, in a sense, it's it's a series of before and afters. It is very much uh, literature reviews and the kind of potential or hypothetical ideas that are in no way tested or treated seriously. Uh, yeah, I don't. I don't think it's it's particularly going anywhere. And I think part of the problem that we have is that people don't talk about literature the way they talk about art and music. They don't, they, we don't have the, the talented amateurs sitting around with a glass of wine, just enjoying a discussion about literature. You get it in book clubs. Um, and I'm hoping that we'll get it through this podcast that we, we do this and hopefully other people will join us um, and, you know, get a word in between my long monologues. Slide a word in as they're listening. Yeah. Bring in the wine and I'll be a bit more chatty. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Now, I also know that A Lover's Discourse wasn't just Bart. He didn't just go sit in a room and write it, did he? Like it, this idea of the writer in the garret does not apply to Bart's. Um, no, it doesn't. Tell and us it's more. going to become obvious once I continue. <laughs> Fragments had one beginning in January 1975 in Bart's seminar at the Ecola de Hortes Etudes and Sciences Sociales. <laughs> 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 oh, yeah. I apologize to any French audience. We did our best. Just <laughs> we sounded it out phonetically. Yeah. Google Translate. Just as, oh, yeah. Just as previously, he had devoted two years of the seminar to the analysis of Sarazine, a short novel by Balzac, an analysis subsequently written as S.Z., so now it is to be given over to another text, another fiction, Goethe's Die Leiden des Jungen Wörter, 
the supreme book of love. It's suffering, joy of passion. So I actually studied German. So German is a lot more easier for me. Yeah, you flew through <laughs> that. I was very impressed. Did, did you uh, read Goethe yeah. at all? Uh, no, I didn't. I like the uh, literary literature background that you have. Well, this is an interesting one. Um, the Sorrows of Young Werther uh, is about a guy who is passionately in love with a woman, Charlotte. And he, it, his, his love for her torments him. She's quite befuddled by this. And he ends up killing himself. Sorry, folks, I'm going to ruin it for you. But it's important. He ends up, I think he shoots himself. I can't remember. Um, but he has this uh, blue waistcoat with yellow buttons. And a whole raft of men in love read this book, fell in love with women, became absolutely despairing, shot themselves wearing blue waistcoat, yellow buttons. It started a, a cult of death, I suppose, or a cult How of How interesting. Heartbreak. Yeah, and it, it was um it was quite a as a, a a matter for concern at the time. Like uh you know, all the young people they're cutting themselves. Well, back in the day when things were edgier, uh people were walking around <laughs> with these little derringers and blowing their brains out whilst wearing the very cool coordinated waistcoats. Yeah, I really want one, <laughs> minus the gun part. Right? Now, if that doesn't deserve to be on TikTok somehow, I don't know what's going on. Um, but yes. <laughs> Neither so, do I. So that's the supreme book of love, the suffering joy of passion. That's, I mean, it's a good one for him to have picked. Yeah. And to discuss with his students. Yeah. The similarity, however, stops there. Object and method change. Text of the symbolic Sarazine classically ordered and at the same time reflexively in excess of that order was copied out, commented on, fractured and traced over in its process of meanings, its possible plurality, text of the imaginary. Verta is taken as a site of figures, a kind of book of moments, the possibility of so many quotations of a subject in a discourse of love. That's about, that's about the size of it. So as I said, is, is extremely clinical and difficult. And we absolutely have to talk about it at some point because it is just bonkers. What he, what he traces in S said is actually not Sarazine, but his reading of Sarazine. So he's, mm, he's tracing his yes. own psychological processes through the book. And with, did you want to go into depth? Okay, not in depth because I know you did your thesis on this, no. but maybe three sentences to explain the methodology behind the S said and what he's trying to achieve. Three sentences. Okay. Go. So <laughs> using five textual codes, uh, dealing with things like hermeneutics, which is the questions and answers, symbolism, semantics, and so forth, comma, uh, Barthes was able to create a framework around this short novel. Is that one sentence? It was a long one. but yeah. uh, What we discover, however, is that he's not analyzing the novel on its own because included in this is his own cultural knowledge and of the associations and personal history, which gets drawn into the reading. What I discovered from doing, from exploring this and then doing one of these analyses on a Raymond Chandler novel was that I found I could recreate Chandler almost through an, an hypnotic process where I could write Chandler like doing an impersonation. I could write huge chunks of Chandler in short periods of time with an absolute certainty of where the story should be going that I do not have in my own work. And that is fascinating, isn't it? Um, so that's what Barts was trying to do. That's why I am so fascinated by it in three sentences. They were long, but they were three. Yeah, there was a few co uh, commas and semicolons I in there. I slipped in the semicolon. You... There were some brackets yeah, I did hear it. and some parentheses. <laughs> Very yeah. good. So definitely, he's um, analysed Sarah's scene 
clinically, like you said, whereas this is more the feelings, the emotions within this text. Yeah, it's a lot more random. Um, it's staged uh, alphabetically. I know that um, in an interview, Bart said that he um, originally thought perhaps the first of the fragments would be around uh, the site of Love at First Sight. So the site, S-I-T-E, the space of Love at First Sight. I'm doing finger things. Even on YouTube, no one would know what I was doing right now. I was just doing no. some finger movements. Um around my eyes to indicate sight. So, yeah, love at first sight. But what he realized was that love at first sight might not be the beginning of love. And so placing it at the front would be misleading uh, and, and something of a of falsehood. So he abandoned that completely and just used an alphabetical system. So for a reader in the depths of despair, you think to yourself, I'm in despair you go to D, you look around, you find despair. I believe it's in there. Um, and uh, and then you read what the lover says about despair, and frequently it, it captures exactly um, what you're feeling. I don't think despair is in there, actually. No, but there's dependency and drama. So I would say they kind of combine. Yeah, alone. There's suicide. The will to possess. Jealousy. Jealousy. I feel like there is something there. Adoration, enrollment. Mm. Crying. Oh, ravishment. So many things. The will to possess. Demons. Oh, this is a great book. Yeah. Yeah. There's some great stuff. Uh, fade out. That's a brutal one. We all we all know about the fade out. Unbearable, oh, I think, uh, was one that I found very helpful at the time. Okay. Well, yes. I'm going to finish this paragraph so we can go into depth onto um, a lover's discourse. Okay. What is at stake in fragments is the practice of a new writing, something of the creation of a new literary mode, neither analysis nor autobiography, which is not at all to exclude elements of analysis, elements of autobiography. It sets out the space of an imaginary, the reflections and recognitions and crystallizations of an I, a lover, a consistence of discourse. In this writing, this mode, Verta, the main accompanying text, the regular reading is not an object of study, but a reconstituted nearness. Verta, old-fashioned, a trifle ridiculous for modern taste, is a quarried used, made available. Bart's aim is one of simulation. Fragments simulates the lover subject in discourse. The brief introductory phrase is explicit. So it is a lover who speaks and who says. The book is thus the staging of an utterance and its method, its strategy of writing, is figurative. The lover presented dispersed in the sprays of figures in which he or she consists comes together in love. A single being, but a host of figures. I'm going to jump in On there. This... It's been ages since I interrupted you. I'm so close to finishing. I know, okay. I know. But this is this is quite important, because, and I'm worried we'll forget to mention it later. So when we talk okay. about these spray of figures, a host of figures, Bart, Bart will refer to this. No, it's the singular Bart. Bart will refer to this as the image repertoire. Um, yeah. The way the various poses in which we identify ourselves as lovers or we identify the beloved, an image repertoire. Um, and that comes up a lot in this book. So that, those are the host of figures, our sense of self. Yeah. On this closeness of simulation, no better language, no second order system of explanation, only and with the lover, the action of a primary language depends the effect of the book as a series of, of little scenes. Tableau, an assembly of citations of love, the fragments exactly of a discourse. Yes, yeah, so no meta language, no language outside, only the language of the lover speaking to the reader at all times. It's quite fantastic in that way, really unusual. That's a pretty good introduction coming in at just under an hour. And, uh, <laughs> okay. 
all of which um, brings us to a lover's discourse uh, proper. And um, this is really going to set us up, I hope, for next week's episode when we do some romance writing. Uh, I think we said we were going to do romance writing this week, but we got hijacked by my absurd puppy-like enthusiasm for a lover's discourse. Uh, mm-hmm. So sorry about that, folks. Now, this the one. The ultimate fanboy. I know. Such a fanboy. Such a Bartsian. Is that right? Um, this one's translated by Richard Howard. So, so he did translate this one. And it is actually A Lover's Discourse Fragments. Um, a Lover's Discourse is the primary title. Uh, and then Fragments, because this is very much a kind of a literary work, uh, an academic work, it has a subtitle. Fortunately, short, which is just fragments. But the fragments is incredibly important. The fragmented structure of this work is a huge part of what makes it work. Uh, any attempt to sort of pull it into some kind of coherent, novelistic, linear structure is a complete waste of time. So if you're going to read it from beginning to end, forget about that right now. Don't do it. It wasn't meant to be done that way. Uh, by all means, read it from cover to cover. Just go on a route that pleases you. Start wherever the heck you like. I mean, maybe read the introduction and then just start wherever the heck you like. Uh, wherever you're feeling. Yeah, I think so. I think so. Mind you, the book does you're try to. you're feeling flayed, go to page 95. Yeah, yeah. It's like a choose your own adventure. If you're feeling flayed, yeah. go to page 95. And if you're feeling uh, unknowable, go to page 134. <laughs> right. You're feeling mad, 120. <laughs> right. <laughs> and you'll find an ending. Um, however, the book actually does begin at, with, with its beginning in the, in the sense that uh, Bartz provides a short introduction that leads us into the first of the fragments. Um, but then after that, go nuts. Anyways, uh, so I love his discourse. The necessity for this book is to be found in the following consideration that the lover's discourse is today of an extreme solitude. This discourse is spoken perhaps by thousands of subjects, who knows, but warranted by no one. It is completely forsaken by the surrounding languages, ignored, disparaged or derided by them, severed not only from authority, but also from the mechanisms of authority, sciences, techniques, arts. Once a discourse is thus driven by its own momentum into the backwater of the unreal, exiled from all gregarity, it has no recourse but to become the site, however exiguous, of an affirmation. That affirmation is, in short, the subject of the book, which begins here, Shannon. I am engulfed, I succumb. Now, the definition of this is an outburst of annihilation which affects the amorous subject in despair or fulfillment. Either woe or well-being, sometimes I have a craving to be engulfed. This morning in the country, the weather is mild, overcast. I am suffering from some incident. The notion of suicide occurs to me, pure of any resentment, not blackmailing anyone, an insipid notion. It alters nothing, breaks nothing, matches the colour, the silence, the desolation of this morning. Another day in the rain, we're waiting for the boat at the lake. From happiness this time, the same outburst of annihilation sweeps through me. This is how it happens sometimes. Misery or joy engulfs me without any particular tumult ensuing, nor any pathos. I am dissolved, not dismembered. I fall, I flow, I melt. Such thoughts graze, touched, tested the way you test the water with your foot can recur. Nothing solemn about them. This is exactly what gentleness is. That's a really beautiful beginning, isn't it? Um, mm. And so in this we have the, the structure, we have a title, then we have a definition, uh, which we'll take turns reading, we'll bounce around, and then the main the main text. I just want to jump backwards really quickly to the note. The lover's discourse is today of an extreme solitude. Doesn't that remind you of the situation of the figure of the writer 
in the garret completely alone, cut off from any kind of legitimate academia. Um, and, you know, there, there are uh, writing groups, there is fan fiction, there are things that are sort of um, existing in, in certain spaces. But fan fiction is seen uh, as trivial, fairly or unfairly in certain quarters. Um, yeah. And, you know, to a large extent, I think creative writing uh, theory is still not seen as legitimate, um, a legitimate sort of science or theoretical framework. So it is very much like the voice of the lover, which um, which exists in a in a kind of a, a a space of extreme solitude. I can't think of a better way of putting it. It's it's exactly that. And what you get then is the need for an affirmation. Uh, a voice in simulation. And I think that's why this idea of writing in, writing in pleasure, as opposed to writing about pleasure, is the key thing here. I think this is also true of writing theory, of learning to write. You must write in the voice of writing, not write about the voice of writing. Writing in pleasure. So I did some writing yesterday. To me, coffee is pleasurable. I had a cookie as well, which is pleasurable. And I got to sit and talk to my friend who would occasionally come and chat with me. So he's the barista. So I went out of my way to create an environment, a setting of all these pleasurable things. And it worked really well. I had a great writing day. And I think your writing groups and your workshops should be something similar. Mm. Yeah, absolutely. The idea that you would suffer in a garret to produce pleasure or, or produce misery even um, mm. seems quite absurd that you'd be completely cut off from the sort of uh, emotional uh, connections that are required to create such work. Um, yeah, it's, it's quite, a, quite a strange thing. I think the lover and the writer uh, in a contemporary space are very similar. And so you get these feelings, yeah. these feelings of in, of being engulfed. And I always think when I read that, it's a little bit like writerly uh, inspiration. Yeah. Sort of, and it is gentle. Um, not so much the uh, the suicidal writing drive to th- to burn everything you've ever written, not to make anyone feel bad, just just because. Yeah. So I'm engulfed, I succumb. I must admit, I see that much more as a writing thing than a, than, a, than a thing about love for me personally. But when we get to agony. The amorous subject, according to one contingency or another, feels swept away by the fear of a danger, an injury, an abandonment, a revulsion, a sentiment he expresses under the name of anxiety. Tonight, I came back to the hotel alone. The other has decided to return later on. The anxieties are already here, like the poison already prepared. Jealousy, abandonment, restlessness. They merely wait for a little time to pass in order to be able to declare themselves with some propriety. I pick up a book and take a sleeping pill, calmly. The silence of this huge hotel is echoing, indifferent, idiotic the faint murmur of draining bathtubs. The furniture and the lamps are stupid. Nothing friendly that might warm. I'm cold, let's go back to Paris. Anxiety mounts. I observe its progress, like Socrates chatting as I am reading and feeling the cold of the hemlock rising in his body. I hear it identify itself moving up like an inexorable figure against the background of the things that are here. And if so that something might happen, I were to make a vow. The psychotic lives in the terror of breakdown, against which the very psychosis are merely defences. But the clinical fear of breakdown is the fear of a breakdown which has already been experienced, primitive agony. And there are moments when a patient needs to be told that the breakdown, fear of which is wrecking his life, has already occurred. Similarly, it seems for the lover's anxiety, it is the fear of a mourning which has already occurred at the very origin of love, from the moment when I was first ravished. Someone would have to be able to tell me, don't be anxious anymore, 
you've already lost him slash her. Wow. Isn't that, isn't that amazing? <laughs> yes. I, I'm just, oh God, it's exactly right. Uh, mm. You know, it's, it's that Shakespearean thing. It's better to have loved and lost uh, than to have never, never loved, loved at, at all. all. But the, um, the moment of being ravished, of, of falling in love, is a moment of mourning, of extreme anxiety, the loss of the other. And it manifests itself in all kinds of ways. But it's also inevitable, the loss of the other. You, you will lose them. It's, it's so, and, and I think everyone understands this. Uh, and I think my commentary right now is telling our listeners and viewers nothing they don't already know. So I apologize for being redundant. Uh, yeah. But it's something you can't talk about it. You feel it. We felt it. And it was spoken there. It, mm. it, for me. In a scene. Yeah. I mean, these words are not in my voice. Uh, and in fact, in the second section, they were quite literally in your voice. But. Um, that idea is so much the lover's idea. It is sort of not an idea that is affirmed typically. It can be played out as a scene maybe, but uh, I remember the, when, I, when I was first rejected by a woman the first time, not the last time, but the first time, and I was crushed. <laughs> I was so crushed. And this idea that I was always going to lose her, and I should have realized that from the first giddy moment. And the pain I was feeling was a pain that I could possibly have even spread out a bit and allowed to not be quite so painful at the end. All those ideas were, at the time, profoundly comforting to me. And also the universality of all this, that, that I felt like I had uh, arrived at an insight that was uh, a unique insight and one that defined, you know, the great love that I had with this, this woman who, uh, whose name escapes me. I, I was, this was the greatest love affair of all time. And to see the same depth of, uh, neurosis and, uh, and egotism and innocence and heartbreak played out there, uh, with draining bathtubs and Socrates reading. Um, yeah, it was, a, it was like a balm to the old heart. It really made me feel better at the time. And I remember this one was a big one for me. Yeah. Shall we continue? Yes. So we picked love, these, love. not at random, but they're a selection and they're cut down. This is a fun one. To love, love. Explosion of language during which the subject manages to annul the loved object under the volume of love itself. By a specifically amorous perversion, it is love the subject loves, not the object. Charlotte is quite insipid. She is the paltry character of a powerful, tormented, flamboyant drama staged by the subject Werther. By a kindly decision of this subject, a colourless object is placed in the centre of the stage and they're adored, idolised, taken to task, covered with discourse, with prayers, and perhaps surreptitiously with invectives. As if she were a huge motionless hen huddled amid her feathers around which circles a slightly mad cock. Enough that, in a flash, I should see the other in the guise of an inert object like a kind of stuffed doll, for me to shift my desire from this annulled object to my desire itself. It is my desire I desire, and the loved being is no more than its tool. I rejoice at the thought of such, gr uh, such a great cause, which leaves far behind it the person whom I have made into its pretext. Are you reminded of Romeo and Juliet? Indeed. <clears throat> Wasn't... Juliet's predecessor, Charlotte? Am I mad? I don't know the text well enough to correct you or otherwise. Well, somebody should. Somebody should get over here in the comment section and correct me. I'm just saying all kinds of stuff that might be wrong. I'm pretty sure that <laughs> Romeo was into Charlotte. And then Charlotte was like, nah, I don't want you. And, um, and then he's like, well, I'm, I've got to kill myself. It's over, clearly. 
uh, my great love yeah. is dead. And then Juliet walks by and he's like, what? Bonga, bonga, bonga. And starts running after her. Um, and if Romeo isn't in love with love, I don't know what's going on. Yeah. I mean, you could say that Charlotte is the predecessor and also Virtus is inspiration. Yes, except Romeo and Juliet would be before, right? Uh, yeah. However, you're right, you're right. Fear not. We can salvage this. My maths is also terrible. According to Harold Bloom, if the writer brings something back in its difference to such a powerful effect, they become the originator of that thing, and everything that preceded them is a copy. And in that way, for example, when we talk about Chaucer, a lot of academics talk about Chaucer as though he was influenced by Shakespeare, not the other way around. Now, admittedly, trying to get this rather obscure novel by Goethe over the top of Shakespeare's Romeo and Juliet, this is our challenge now, and I'm not sure we're going to pull it off. But I think what we can say is that we've distracted the audience long enough to go back to the next Fragment, which is waiting. Waiting. A tumult of anxiety provoked by waiting for the loved being, subject to trivial delays, rendezvous, letters, telephone calls, returns, and now, of course, we would add text messages, uh, TikTok videos, and shorts from the pleasure of the text. Snapchats. (laughs) I'm waiting for an arrival, a return, a promised sign. This can be futile or immensely pathetic. In Erwartung, a woman waits for her lover. Sorry, Erwartung means waiting. A woman waiting for her lover at night in the forest. I'm waiting for no more than a telephone call, but the anxiety is the same. Everything is solemn. I have no sense of proportions. There is a sonography of waiting. I organize it, manipulate it, cut out a portion of time in which I shall mind the loss of the loved object and provoke all the effects of a minor mourning. This is then acted out as a play. The setting represents the interior of a cafe. We have a rendezvous. I am waiting. In the prologue, the sole actor of the play and with reason, I discern and indicate the other's delay. This delay is as yet only a mathematical, computable entity. I look at my watch several times. The prologue ends with a brainstorm. I decide to take it badly. (laughs) So, I just love that. I decide to take it badly. Now, (laughs) I'm also reminded of you in the cafe doing your writing. Imagine if you're waiting for inspiration. Oh, yeah, that is very true. This will be playing out exactly the same way. I'm sorry to interrupt yet again. Don't take it badly. I will not. I release the anxiety of waiting. Act one now begins. It is accompanied by suppositions. Was there a misunderstanding as to the time, the place? I try to recall the moment when the rendezvous was made, the details which were supplied. What is to be done? Anxiety of behavior. Try another cafe, telephone. But if the other comes during these absences, not seeing me, the other might leave, etc. Act two is the act of anger. I address violent reproaches to the absent one. All the same, he, she could have. He, she knows perfectly well. Oh, if she, he could be here so that I could reproach her, him for not being here. In act three, I attain to, I obtain anxiety in the pure state, the anxiety of abandonment. I've just shifted in a second from absence to death. The other is as if dead. Explosion of grief. I am eternally livid. That is the play. It can be shortened by the other's arrival. If the other arrives in act one, the greeting is calm. If the other arrives in act two, there is a scene. If in act two, there is recognition, the action of grace. I breathe deeply like Peleus, emerging from the underground chambers and rediscovering life, the odour of roses. The anxiety of waiting is not continuously violent. It is its mat moments. 
I am waiting, and everything around my waiting is stricken with unreality. In this cafe, I look at the others who come in, chat, joke, read calmly. They are not waiting. Have you ever had that experience, Shannon? Indeed, I have. You're not the only one who has suffered from heartbreak. Oh, no. I thought I was. And I do remember, you know, the grey dots that pop up and disappear. The message has been read and nothing is given back to me in return. Yeah. And you do, don't you? You you start to build a scene around the dots that began and then stopped. Uh, Did he think, no, this is too cruel? I must try and think of something a little kinder to say as I let her go forever. Was I too forward? Yes. And it is like a little death and it is like a little breakup every time. Mm. Uh, And you do catastrophize. You know, when my wife Joan suddenly inexplicably uh, doesn't show up at home when I'm roughly expecting it, I start to think, you know, is she dead? Has she been hit by a train? Oh, my God. Uh, You know, why don't I know where she is? Uh, what did she say she was? Did she tell me? And am I, am I so terrible? I've forgotten. Uh, and you just go through this in, incredible series, don't you? Mm. Of dramatic things. Uh, I think it's scary because I realize I'm not in control of any of it. Yeah. Yeah. The three dots of anxiety. And they're quite like mm, an ellipsis, indeed. aren't they? Yeah. By intention, I wonder. Mm. Well, on to the love letter. The love letter. This figure refers to the special dialectic of the love letter, both blank, encoded, and expressive, charged with longing to signify desire. When Werther, in the ambassador's employ, writes to Charlotte, his letter follows this outline. One, what joy to be thinking of you. Two, here I am in a mundane situation, and without you I feel utterly alone. Three, I have met someone, Fraulein von B, who resembles you and with whom I can speak of you. Four, I keep hoping that we can be reunited. A single piece of information is varied in the manner of a musical theme. And that single piece of information, of course, is I am thinking of you. Now, I've always found this incredibly profound, uh, and I'm constantly telling people this. This next paragraph, what does thinking of you mean? It means forgetting you. Without forgetting, life itself is not possible. And frequently waking out of that forgetfulness. Many things by association bring you back into my discourse. Thinking of you means precisely this metonymy. For in itself, such thinking is blank. I do not think you I simply make you recur to the very degree that I forget you. It is this form, this rhythm, which I call thought. I have nothing to tell you, save that it is to you that I tell this nothing. Why do I turn once again to writing? Beloved, you must not ask such a question. For the truth is, I have nothing to tell you. All the same, your dear hands will hold this note. Love letters. Yes. It's really hard, isn't it, to actually say anything in a love letter? Mm-hmm. Yeah. I've got some of mine, you know, from, from back in the day. The ones that you've received? Oh, yeah. No, I didn't keep or the ones been I given wrote. Back to you. No, no, ones I've received. Um, and, you know, of course, I was writing love letters in an era when it would have been very weird to do them on like a, a typewriter computer or phone. So they were all handwritten, so I don't have copies of them. However, and you've kept them. No, no, I've kept the ones from ex lovers. See, I find that weird because well, my partner has also this. kept, yeah. <laughs> oh, Jones, just, Jones kept why? her old love letters. I think it's, um, it's a profound point in your life. Like, love is a kind of a madness from which we gradually become more and more sane until we seem like the dry burnt out old doctor that runs the sanitarium yes you're in a you know you're in a hysterical point right now uh i don't really that version 
of me and the effect I had on the young ladies that I was courting, uh, that is no longer accessible to me. I, I don't love with that kind of passion anymore. Um, I think uh, I saw an M. Night Shyamalan movie the other day. I know, right? Okay. What a strange thing to bring into this discourse, but this is happening. M. Night Shyamalan, I think it's called Aging or Old. I don't know. I, uh, I just watched it on a whim. Uh, and the characters in it uh, are aging. I think you can get that from the title. I feel like I haven't thrown too many spoilers in. One of the children has aged a lot. And she says, none of the colors are as bright anymore, but there are so many more of them. And so the love letters, what I see in that are these bright colors and a profound lack of complexity. And really they are letters that say, I so desperately want to tell you that I have nothing to tell you. Okay. Which is pretty much what's in a lover's discourse. But I think that is exactly what it is. The only thing you can tell the person is I love you. You know, I love you, I love you, I love you. Until the words could be in any order, you know. You I love, love I you. <laughs> uh, you can string them around. And in fact, in a lover's discourse, they have je t'aime, I love you. It's about six pages. Decided not to talk about that one because it's so long. Um, but just the emptiness of the phrase I love you. Um, it's almost impossible to break down into anything meaningful. Uh, and, and also, you know, he discusses the various responses one could give to, I love you, such as I know, so do I, that's upsetting. I didn't know that. <laughs> go away. Go away. <laughs> you know, you're not going to say anything too profound to it. Like it's, it's a question as much as it is a statement. It requires an answer. Um, but the answer will not be that profound in any case. All that stuff's fascinating. I think the love letter is like a profound gesture of that. You are desperately trying to show someone how much you don't have to say to them, in a sense. It's, a, it's an inexpressible yearning. Um, and, so, and so Verta says, the thing, the point is that you will be holding this letter. So when I say you've got nothing to say, I'm not, I'm not being cruel and saying, you know, it's all nonsense. What I'm saying is that it's, it, it boils down to a feeling. The feeling is expressible much more easily in ways that are not communicated through language or through textual language. And in a love letter, we need to fill at least two pages based on this thing that we can't describe in any number of words. <laughs> so, yeah. yeah. I think it's pretty amazing. And this, of course, leads us to our final fragment that we're going to talk about today because this will lead into next week's episode, uh, which is... Inexpressible love. A.K.A. to write, uh, defined as enticements, arguments, and impasses generated by the desire to express amorous feelings in a creation, particularly of writing. Ah, I see why you've included this one now. Uh-huh. Yeah, always a plan. Bingo. Always a plan. <laughs> <laughs> Two powerful myths have persuaded us that love could, should be sublimated in aesthetic creation. The Socratic myth, loving serves to engender a host of beautiful discourses, and the romantic myth, I shall produce an immortal work by writing my passion. I think writing actually so much of a romantic myth, but I'll continue. <laughs> Yet Werther, who used to draw abundantly and skillfully, cannot draw Charlotte's portrait. He can scarcely sketch her silhouette, which is precisely the thing about her that first captivated him. I have lost the sacred life-giving power with which I created worlds about me. A haiku. The full moon this fall... All night long, I have paced around the pond. So just before we jump back in, what's what's going on here? I, especially in writing, I think you have this image, and I'm going to superpose this against Charlotte's image, his love. Um, what you have in your brain, the romantic myth, it doesn't come out onto the page. And why is that? I think this is what Werther is talking about. Yeah, I think so too. I mean, I, 
I don't think I could accurately describe Joan. I could accurately describe you. I could accurately describe most of my friends. But Joan remains a sort of an amorphous character. I, she, in the image repertoire that makes up my, my understanding of, of my wife, I can see her eyes. I can see her mouth. I can see her nose. I can't see them all together. And when I do see them all together, they're blurry. It's, it's a sort of a, it's a difficult thing. And I, I, I think this is very common for, for people, for partners, um, people in love that they, they find there's an inexpressible quality to the other. That seems to be the important point. And um, everything they say about them is too much and not enough. Mm. And so when you're trying to write a poem to express your love, you kind of know you're going to say too much and not enough. <laughs> what, a, what a nightmare. Um, and I feel like the full moon this fall, all night long, I have paced around the pond, feels like it says very little, but also perhaps potentially too much. It says a lot. I think we've all been there. Maybe not a pond or in a full moon. Yeah, well. No indirect means could be more effective in the expression of sadness than that all night long. What if I were to try it myself? This summer morning, the bay sparkling, I went outside to pick a wisteria. Or... This morning, the bay sparkling, I stayed here motionless, thinking of who is gone. On the one hand, this is saying nothing. On the other, it is saying too much. Impossible to adjust. My expressive needs oscillate between the mild little haiku summarizing a huge situation and a great flood of banalities. I am both too big and too weak for writing. I am alongside it, for writing is always dense, violent, indifferent to the infantile ego which solicits it. Love has a course of complicity with my language, which maintains it, but it cannot be lodged in my writing. Yes. Well, I mean, he said what I was saying, or I said what he was saying, but he said it better. Um, yeah. Who said it first? Who, who wore it better? I think Bart wins both. Uh this is a very important quote um, that ties into this other one. It's from later in the same fragment. Uh, it's the fifth uh, facet of that fragment. To know that one does not write for the other, to know that these things I am going to write will never cause me to be loved by the one I love, the other. To know that writing compensates for nothing, sublimates nothing, that it is precisely there where you are not. This is the beginning of writing. And I know you want to expand on that. I do want to expand on it, but I also just want to let it land. I kind of, I, I feel like right now I'm in this terrible conundrum where I know that I'm going to talk too much, ruin the moment, but I'm not going to manage to say what needs to be said. I am, I am <laughs> the absolute lover's dilemma. And Yes. Yeah. Um, I think... I think the key thing here is that that writing has a life that is beyond the writer. So, you know, I, I can't help these days but read a lover's discourse as a writer's discourse. And I think that um, to a large extent, the beloved, the, the, te the sort of the text that one idealizes and has a you know when you're thinking about writing a text it's a series of fragments that feel like they make a cohesive whole but of course they don't and when you try and explain your text at parties you can't people kind of go what's it about and you start telling them and they their eyes glaze over but you realize you haven't actually explained anything about what you're doing isn't it like being in love isn't it just like being in love romantic passionate love um which is very hard to maintain uh, in the real world where we age and get wonky knees and uh, want to watch something on television. But in the world of literature, in the, in the world of the text, one is ageless. The present is always perpetual. And our, our loves 
uh, well, we're polyamorous, aren't we? Uh, we're moving from book to book, but those books are moving from reader to reader. And in, in around all of this is this possibility of collaboration. And I feel, yeah, I feel like that's, writing is not an extension of the writer. It can never be that. Um, so, you know, that's a really important thing. Writing is precisely there where you are not. Mm. Yeah. And I want to say this line here, to know that one does not write for the other, to know that these things I'm going to write will never cause be, cause me to be loved by the other, by the one. And I think when people first sit down to write, they start thinking about their audience. But you're not sitting down to write for the other, for the audience. And you can't guarantee and know that what you write will cause you to be loved by the audience. That, that's um, very profound. Yes, I agree on 100%. Exactly. 100%. I think what you can do, though, is surround yourself by other lovers, other passionate, heartbroken, gun-toting, blue waistcoat wear and crazy people looking for dots on their phone. Uh, I'm going to remove all the knives from the drawers <laughs> and all the guns. <laughs> right. Uh, this group way to get together. Writing workshops are terrifying places. You never know who's going next, <laughs> like an Agatha Christie novel. Mm -hmm. Um yeah, and, and, and I think that that is, that is your community. It's actually not readers. Uh, you can certainly enjoy books with readers, but I think, in a sense, your, your audience is not these, these hypothetical readers, this image repertoire where we have, um, you know, this ideal reader that there will be this and that and this and that. It's all nonsense. Um, yeah. I think that you're, you're in an amorous embrace with the text you are writing, which which is a cruel creature which will leave you at first chance and hook itself onto somebody else. Um, yeah, and, and, but, but as a book about love, this is a profound book. And I would, because this is essentially a review, it's a weird review. It's a fragmented, messy, post-structuralist review that's brought in other books and gone crazy and talked about Barts and completely uh, gone beyond what, he could possibly have intended and started applying a reading about creative writing theory over the top. It's all of that. It's madness. He'd love it. He'd probably disagree with all of it mm. and he'd love it. I'm giving a lover's discourse, shock horror, five stars. Well, I can't review it because I haven't read the whole thing it's yet. It's reviewistic. And the thing about a lover's okay. discourse is you don't have to read the whole thing. And in fact, if you read the whole thing, you may start reading it in other books as well. Mm. I do have to give this a five out of five because um, we had it said that you can't write about love and yet somehow this encapsulates love. And we're going to actually try. We're going to be writing about love in our next podcast when we talk about the first, the first kiss. Those between kids. the lover and the other. Yes, and I will be reading a lover's discourse in the lead up to that. I will be flipping through it, feeling the drama, being deeply disturbed by dripping taps. And uh, I think we're going to do something pretty amazing, even though we can't write it in French. No. Yes, I'm also going to be talking about the unknowable. Ah, oh, the unknowable. Because I think, especially in that first kiss, it's the unknowable is it or isn't it oh my to be or not to, to, be, be, or not to be. be being coming whatever spending. they decide that's a weird one well i am spent this has been a long podcast it has again i hope everyone's enjoyed spending their time here Yes, um, and getting to know a bit more about Roland Barthes and all he has to offer in terms of love and also um, the practice of writing and the adventure of creative writing. And, you know, this the, there's, I don't know if people can hear it, but there's rain pouring down, there's a storm happening. I'm going to jump off because it's very horrific or slightly romantic. <laughs> But next week we're going to be doing a romance writing scene. I'm very excited. I'm terrified. So but until yes. then, can you not hear the wind? No, I can't hear any of it. So you're in Wuthering Heights, and I'm, I'm not. 
And in the love scene, we're going to be digging up a dead body. No, I'm oh kidding. Oh, my God. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I'll see everyone next week. And you too, guys. Okay, great. <laughs> Goodbye, folks. Goodbye.